This is module 5 of our Excel Visual Basic training course, Definitions. Now although this may seem like a dry module with relatively little content, it's actually going to be an absolutely vital piece of what we do. Consider the following macro. This macro's job is very simply to populate this table by summing the two numbers in columns A and B and putting the answer in column C and putting their product in column D. So let's just briefly take you through the macro. Firstly, it's going to run every single time the sheet is changed. That's why we've made it private sub worksheet change by val target as range. And we've also disabled events at the start and enabled them again at the end. It's going to calculate the sum and product for every row from 2 to 6. So we've got a little 4 next loop. And then we've obviously got the code which does the addition and multiplication itself. So if we make a change to the sheet, we should get all the answers. Now consider the same macro written into a different Excel sheet. Suppose we want to make changes to the sheet. For instance, I feel like inserting a column at the start of the sheet. I've made a change to the worksheet, so the macro has been run. But it's not giving us the right answer. The problem is that the first column is now blank. But our code still says you should be adding the first column to the second column, which if you look in column C, it has done, and that the fourth column should be the product of the first and second column, which again, by putting zero as a solution, is absolutely right, but it's not much use to us. Therefore, there's a fundamental problem that when we change our Excel worksheets, we're in danger of invalidating all the code that we've written. The solution to this actually lies within Excel itself. Within Excel, you can give different cells or different columns names. If you select a column, you can give it the name first col if it contains the first number. You can give the next column the name second col, the sum column the name sum col, and the product column the name product col. Now we have names attached for different columns, which will stay attached even when we insert or delete columns. However, at present we have no way of referring to them in the code. We want to create a variable first col, which always has the same value as the number column which the first number is in. So we can do that using this notation. First col equals range, then notice the parentheses, first col dot column. That means it will ask Excel which number column has the name first col and it will always do this when it defines first col. It means we can replace one as a column number in the code with first col. We now repeat this process for all four columns. If it seems rather arduous it is a small price to pay for being able to make changes to your worksheet. Now if we re-enter Excel and insert a column, we can see our macro is unaffected. However, we can't insert rows at the moment because we've defined the row numbers as being rows 2 to 6. If we inserted a row at the top, the header row would be 2 and Excel would be left trying to sum words together and it would cause an error. Therefore we can name the header row, header row. To derive a permanent value for this, we use header row equals range, parenthesis, header row, and then at the end, instead of dot column, we put dot row. So now we should say for row num equals header row plus one, so the row below the header, to six. This still does not completely solve our problems, because if we insert a row at the top now, although the macro works, we've moved the bottom row into row seven. So if we change the second number here, the macro no longer gives us a correct solution. What we really want to do is say sum and multiply each row of data until there is no more data. This requires a change of approach. We could just ask Excel to sum and multiply any row up to 1000. This does work as you can see. Unfortunately, it also tries to sum and multiply all the rows which don't contain any data. 
The way to avoid this is to exit our for loop at the time when the computer finds no more data. So what we can say is if cells row num first call is blank, to indicate blank you have to say equals and then parenthesis with nothing between them, then go to exit loop. Exit loop is a point we can define after the loop. Notice we need to use a colon as punctuation after exit loop to make it a row name. So now when the macro finds no data in the first number column it will stop trying to sum and multiply data. Except it will already have tried to sum and multiply that low so we need to move this line of code to the top of our for next loop to prevent it trying to process one row of data too much. Now if we make changes we get the desired result. This is a fantastically powerful technique because we can extend the table any way we like. We can shift the product column off to the side and add a subtract column. If we call the subtract column subtract col, we can add corresponding code to add the answers to our table. So subtract col equals range subtract col dot column and cells row num subtract col obviously equals the number in the second column taken away from the first column. If we make a change we can see it now works. The point is that by defining ranges as they are known within Excel we have far more flexibility in the way we develop our spreadsheets. There is one more thing to note. When we've been writing worksheet change at the start of macros We've always written this little bit at the end by val target as range and we've never said exactly what that means. What it in fact means is that Excel knows which cell you have changed when you've made a change to the code. In this case it may be desirable to only change the table if changes are made to the first or second number columns in the spreadsheet. Therefore we need to know which column the change has been made in so we'll say targ col equals target dot column. Now if tar call is equal to first call or tar call is equal to second call then we want to go ahead and recalculate the sheet. That means we have to tab out the area below and we have to put an end if statement at the end of the processing area of the macro. Note that when using if statements you can impose multiple conditions. So you can say if one thing is true and another thing is true or you can say if one thing is true or another thing is true then go ahead and do this. Perhaps we should make another condition and say only recalculate the table if changes occur below the header row. So now we need to identify the row which has changed. So targrow row equals target dot row and we can add it as another if statement or we can add it as another condition within the if statement we already have so targ call has to equal first call or second call so we put brackets around that like you would if you were doing maths and targ row has to be greater than header row so now we only update the table if certain conditions are met there is one more little thing to this definition section. When we refer to cells, Excel will either take it as meaning we're referring to cells within the sheet that we're writing code, so in this case we're working within sheet 1, which is the one with the name X1, or if you write it in this workbook or a separate module, it will interpret it as meaning the cells on whichever sheet you have active at the time. What happens if we just want to refer to one sheet cells? After all, we don't wish addition to occur on, for instance, our title page every time we make a change. To do that, we need to give the sheet a name. Now, it's got a name EX1, but just like cells can move around, people can rename sheets within Excel. Therefore, we should bring up the Properties window off the View menu, double-click on Sheet 1, and now we can see that the name for the sheet is displayed at the top as sheet 1. 
Let's call it sheet calc, as in short for calculator. Now to ensure that our macro only refers to the cells within that sheet, we can very simply write sheet calc in front of all our ranges and in front of all our cells. The quickest way is to go on the edit menu and find and replace, so replace range with sheet calc.range and replace cells with sheet calc.cells. There is one slight issue which you may notice which is that the notation at the top for the type of sub has changed range to sheet calc.range. So whenever using shortcuts, do be careful to make sure that you do really wish to replace all the text within the area with the new phrase. And now we have a macro which only refers to the specific sheet in which we've built a calculator. There is one last little trick to show you. That's that we've written a load of names into Excel, but how do we find out what names exist? Well, the way to do this within Excel 2003 is to go to Insert, Name, Define, and then you get a list of all the names you have within Excel. So it says first col is equal to column B on this spreadsheet, and it'll show you, if you click on the name, exactly where that is. Header row, well, that's equal to the place where the header is.